So, welcome everyone. Um, so, this will be a general guide to what makes a good QA and how to write a good CV. I realize it's a bit disjointed perhaps at first, but it's because, you know, I figured I wouldn't be able to fill the time with just talking about QA. Uh, plus, I really wanted to give some good CV advice uh, because I do a lot of CV reviews and I see usually the same mistakes being repeated over and over again. So sharing some of that knowledge, I think, will be good. Um, so a little bit about me. I started in the industry in 2017 at TT Games. Uh, got into a QA position straight out of uni. Uh, in fact, while I was still in the second year of uni, I, I, I went into TT. And originally I was, uh, I wanted to be an environment artist, but uh, I've, I've really liked the job at TT um, as a QA and a kind of kind of stuck around with it. So been at seven companies so far, Expression Games being the seventh one. Um, so I've been around a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, so about me. Um, Fabric, Fire Sprite, Paladin, for example, there were a bit of shorter ten years. Cloud Imperium, I've spent nearly two years at. Sony, nearly a year. Uh, TT, a year and a half, I think, roughly thereabouts. An expression coming up on two years. So, in fact, I'm about to reach eight years. Um, but, yeah, been a QA lead about four of those years. So that's a little bit about me. Now, uh, we'll start with the QA section. And I'll just briefly mention why I... Uh, stayed as QA because I think it's important to highlight because, yeah, originally I wanted to be an environment artist, but the kind of, I guess, to call it a vibe, I guess would be correct. Maybe a bit unprofessional, but I really liked the people I worked with at QA and uh, the kind of work you did. Uh, the thing that really made me stay apart from the people is the fact that as QA, you're kind of the the go-to guy for everyone. You're sort of the crossroads where each developer meets and they kind of split off, right? As an environment artist, as a coder, yeah, you talk to other disciplines, but you don't talk to them as often as you do when you're QA. Um, and you don't generally see as much stuff as they do. Whereas when you're QA, you kind of experience everything from every single discipline at, um, at a basic level. Like, maybe not basic, above basic, but, you know, not, like, advanced, but pretty good. You get the idea of what they're doing. Um, every department except the character artist, because I'm scared of them. Um, well, yeah, they don't show me a lot of the work pipelines. I mean, nobody really understands how character artists work. If, if there's a character artist here, hello, uh, I am terrified of you um, and your weird bony structures. Um, so... Yeah, QA can be really fun and it can be really engaging. And at the end of the day, um, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, you just you connect people. I think that's what I really like about it. Not only do you do it for the players, um, but you also you know help your fellow developers. I think it's really satisfying that you have the power to basically you know connect environment art and code, and you make their lives a bit better with some procedure or the way that you correlate bugs together or that you know what will happen if they do a certain thing and then you can warn them ahead of time and yeah just generally like that so um a lot of people have misconceptions uh, about what the job of a qa is especially people who go straight into development i find that people who do a bit of qa at the very least before they go into development they have a bit of a broader horizon in how they interpret not just QA's work, but their own work. Um, typically what will happen is when, once you've experienced how QA operates, when you become that developer in the future, not to say that everyone has to become a developer, but a lot of people do go on to being a developer from QA, um, you get a bit of a different perspective in how you tackle certain things and how you should communicate when you fix those things. Um, so yeah, certain people, even in the industry, will just say, QA just kind of sits there and they throw bugs in and they regress or confirm bugs and they just kind of sit there. Not realistically. Um, in bigger companies, sure, 
um, like, you know, really big companies, right? Certain departments of QA have that kind of a job where they just go for a test case, they bug up whatever is there, and then they go again the next day, and then they confirm the bugs, and then, like, they smoke something, but really that's about it. They don't have any flexibility beyond the means of a test case or giving valuable feedback to development team. But really, that is more the mistake of any large corporation because QA can be so much more than that, um, and it can assist any development team really handily uh, in a lot of different situations. So uh, I've broken it down into five primary things, which I will go through in the following up slides. Um, and this is where I also would like to apologize because my uh, pr my presentation skills in terms of what I put on the slides, yeah, they're a bit text heavy. Not not the horror stories, but they could be better, but stick with me. Um, right, so the five main things that a QA does is they support teams, development teams, but also player bases. They mediate between departments. They connect those departments, uh, whether it be through procedure, additional help, support, or uh, even, you know, if you're good, um, you can anticipate what kind of a bug an environment artist will make when he's working on certain things, for example, and how it might affect a coder uh, or vice versa. Um, assess quality, and this is also in large corporations, usually an often forgotten or ignored aspect of QA is that you have, a, you have a group of people who play your product quite a bit. In fact, the most before it goes out to the general public, you should probably listen to them. You know, not always, but it's good to have an, it's good to listen to every single opinion. And then lastly, the obvious thing is to report bugs, which is what usually QA does, but yeah. Right, so breaking them down, uh, they're on two separate slides um, to support. You have to help with documentation, and it is, you know, to be a good QA, you should be helping with documentation. Developers often don't have time to sort a variety of documents that they will need to update, and you have the general knowledge if you're working close enough with them to really help them with that. So I've, I've done documents for design. I've even done documents for the network team while I was working at CIG, you know, very basic ones. I'm not a programmer, um, but... Yeah, um, that. Uh, also, you have to provide quick and efficient help in issue investigation. So, you know, if you can put yourself in the shoes of any developer, right? They open the engine. Depending on the project, let's say the map you have to load is a specific map and it takes ages to load and you have to, you know, fix an issue. But game development is game development and you hit a different issue while you're trying to hit that, fix that issue. So you message and then QA doesn't respond and it doesn't respond and it does in two hours. But that means by that time you've kind of moved on, loaded a different map, which means now you have to go back, load that map again, look at that thing again. So being on top of like communication, even as simply as, you know, checking your messages often, or like, for example, I have a separate monitor just for chats. Um, can be really helpful. It sounds silly perhaps, but like in, in my previous companies, people always enjoyed that, like they messaged me and the response was usually instant or there was a minute of lag of, well, delay, <laughs> but yes. Uh, being the go-to for certain information. So as I stated earlier, you have a very general know-how when you're working close with your developers. So you will often know generally what a programmer does you will more you will know more than uh what an environment artist might know that the programmer is up to and that that means you can help the environment artist by telling them it's like look this guy isn't available because he's working on this and it'll take him this long and these are the potential problems he might be facing and he can't help you right now but i can help you because the programmer taught me these things um so you sort of that light support person, unit, whatever you want to call yourself uh, as a group um, to really help those developers out. Um, and then last on the rubric, you might laugh. Um, I guess it is. I mean, it's supposed to be funny, but to meme. And what I mean by that is uh, out of all the development and development support departments in game dev, I think QA has the most self-deprecating humor, which uh, 
does uh, it does lend itself quite nicely uh, to crafting some quality memes. And as silly as it might sound, you know, if you're if you're there in the trenches, so to speak, and you have a you have a deadline to meet, and let's say it's last week, and the build has just exploded, or some uh, issue that nobody has uh, foreseen has popped up, and suddenly it means hey, we might overrun, and everyone's panicking. Yeah, dropping a meme. It's actually a very good, nice way of dropping the tension a little bit. Not much, but, you know, as Tesco says, every little helps. Um, so it's good. Uh, and then to moving, up, moving on to mediate, uh, you need to... Uh, a good QA with, will analyze issues and the impact they have on developers and other QA as well. It's, it's one thing to put a bug in, but it's another thing to... Um, it's another thing to, uh, you know, realize that, hey, this bug will affect this person potentially because they're working on this map or they're working on this mechanic and this might be a showstopper for them. Whereas at first glance, it might seem like it's not a big deal. Um, and again, all of this flows back to the fact that, yes, you are development support as QA. As much as you can, you know, you need to relieve those tension points and those pain points. And analyzing issues is part of that. That leads me nicely onto minimizing frustrations. Again, like small things stack up, right? If a developer has a day where they hit seven annoyances, even though they're small, they were still seven annoyances and they will be potentially upset at the end of the day. They will be tired, way more tired than they should have been. If you can eliminate at least four of those frustrations by you know, just letting them know what's up, communicating about certain things that popped up in build um, or things to look out for, then that's really, you know, job well done from a QA perspective. Um, and then lastly, um, you will all probably see that uh, or saw that if you're already in the industry, but addressing misunderstandings and ensuring they do not happen again. Um, oftentimes, you know, certain developers um, Again, it, it comes down to the fact that they might not fully understand what QA is, and a ticket will come in, and they will treat it as an attack of some sorts, for example. Um, and they will get uh, potentially a bit angry about, like, why has this bug come in? Um, other times, it might be less that and more of a case of the, the bug was misworded or the way it was supposed to be fixed was misguided and the fix didn't work or it didn't work in the way it should have worked. And again, you have to have a meeting about this and usually it, is, it will be QA's job to explain what went wrong and what we will do to ensure it will not happen again. And in those moments, again, it's quite valuable to uh, you know, uh, explain the process fully to everyone and sort out, for example, documentation or additional test cases to alleviate any issues. Uh, and then to connect departments, you know, you can use your general knowledge to connect the dots. As I said earlier, um, you do kind of talk to everyone as QA uh, throughout the day. So you will have a general knowledge of what each person does or department or generally where they sit at. Uh, minimizing hindrances, it's kind of similar to minimizing frustrations, uh, but in this case, it's meant more as a what kind of, what stops, you know, animation from talking to audio. Like, what are they waiting for? Are they blocked for something? Can I check something for them? Can I alleviate that, make it a bit quicker so they can get that work done faster? Um, and then lastly, utilizing your connections with everyone. Because you know everyone, you talk to everyone as QA, way more than developers usually would for, in terms of interdepartment communication. You know, you can just say, someone will ask you a question and you will know, oh, that person is working on this because I spoke to them and you can just point them that way. Um, might not be the case in smaller teams, but in medium sized companies like Expression and then in larger companies, that can go a long way because <laughs> there will be a lot of people and a lot of people might not know a lot of other people. God, that was a difficult sentence to say. Oh, right. So, and then the other two, um, to assess quality, and I'll speed up a bit because I think I will overrun, and this is what I was I was fearing. Um, you need to have the difficult conversations the right way. So again, being professional, uh, maintaining, um, you know, standard of communication, 
but not being a, not being afraid to stand up and tell this you know either the producer the developer like this needs fixing or else this will happen and you must understand that those things will happen um, and sometimes it's not easy. I've I've had instances in my career where I had to stand my ground against executive producers. And let me tell you, it's scary. It is very scary, but stand my ground I did. And in the end, you know, as long as you've done your job well and you know for a fact that what you're standing for means exactly what you think it stands for, then it's a fight worth taking. Um, that kind of leads me on to evidence-based approach. Yeah, anything you present, um, it needs to be done in a formal fashion. You can't just guess. Well, you shouldn't just guess or say, I have a feeling or any of such things. That's not really good QA. Everything needs to be backed up by videos or the way you've done things or notes or ideally all of that, really. Mm. And then thinking of different user profiles when you're assessing that quality. So whenever a product is played, obviously you're one single person, but how does a different person um, look into that product, right? Where do they see that quality? What is the market for this game you're making? Uh, will people who don't play platformers as platformers um, play this platformer you're making? Will they have difficulty progressing? Um, this kind of also, well, I'll get onto that on the report bugs, but this kind of also leads on to accessibility. Uh, and then report bugs, which is the main QA thing. Um, prioritization, understanding the design, um, kind of goes hand in hand. You know, you need to understand the game you're working on. You need to understand its deeper connections and how it functions. And that way you can prioritize the bugs uh, accurately. Uh, consider different user skill levels and play styles. Um, you know, you might be good at a game as QA. I know of a few QA who are actually not great at playing video games. And funnily enough, one of them I know, they... <laughs> Their, their QA career started because Ubisoft hired them because they were so bad at the game that they were like, this is great, we will hire you because if you can pass a level, it means anyone can. And they legit told them that, not even making it up. <laughs> so whenever you're testing and whenever you're assessing quality, you need to consider the fact that, hey, some people might struggle with something that seems basic to you and some people will get into a level and they will find... Uh, you know, a box of some sort, and they will do some weird physics hack, and they will fly across that level and speed run it in two minutes. Uh, and it's also difficult to predict that, let me tell you. Uh, a few projects I worked on, uh, it was quite funny seeing user reports come in, and it's like, I didn't know that was possible. Like, I'm, I'm, in, cred I'm in all. Uh, but it was. Certain people are really good at video games. Uh, yeah, and then using your knowledge to connect the dots. So this uh, correlates back to your general of the database, but also what you know of the design of the game. So you will know that if I like if a bug happens at some point in a in a QA's career, they will know if a bug happens, it's more than likely that this and this and that will also happen to it. And you can sort of connect the dots along that way and warn the different departments about a potential incoming disaster. And then last but not least, we got accessibility in edge cases. Um, so again, color blindness, you know, any kind of other disability uh, edge cases as well. Uh, there are literally thousands of them in each project. You need very elaborate test cases sometimes to try and catch them or experiments as I like to call them. Um, but yeah. So I've, I've realized I've kind of doubled up here. So, uh, Forgive me if I repeat sometimes, but what makes someone in QA good at QA, right? Because I've listed all of those things, but what does it kind of mean when you're a QA person? How is that represented in a QA person? How, what you should strive for if you want to be a QA person to be a good QA person? And again, this one, again, sorry for the wall of text. I've tried to reduce it, but I'm terrible at this. Uh, I will definitely not be a graphic designer of any kind. Uh, right, so helping with documentation. Uh, the easiest way, and the way I've always done it, is you just work and you see what annoys you throughout your day. And usually, this might seem silly, but I find that most a lot of QA, they will like get annoyed with something or they will not have the information they need. And instead of 
fixing that situation. They will just go, well, this is annoying, and they'll deal with it, but they won't do anything about it to like mitigate it for the future. Now, whereas a good QA will go, well, this sucks, and we don't have any documentation for it, or it's split across like three different places. I'm just gonna spend some time or talk to my QA lead, if you know, if you're not a QA lead or a senior, if I can do this, and I'll just set up some documentation. I've I've done it at, when I worked at Cloud Imperium Games. I, I was doing it all the time, for example, and people were like, "Wow, this documentation is amazing." I'm like, "Well, it's not amazing. It was just like we needed a reference board of like." which planets have which missions and we didn't have that so i just made it so it's easy to reference um providing quick and efficient help in issue investigation that goes back to engaging in chats and actively thinking on your toes uh you know message comes in and it says hey this is broken on this map and you think okay well this is how you get to it the fastest and then you think about for example which other maps use this asset or something relating to that, for example, something from tech outside. Uh, being the go-to for certain information is about studying the project in pieces or delving into a single thread deeply. So again, you hopefully in any company you work at or will work at as QA uh, or even developers, you should have all the information accessible to you across a lot of different chats. If you look through those chats and it might sound silly, like, oh, yeah, thanks, Patrick, great advice, read chats. Duh. But trust me, a lot of people don't actually read chats, which I find quite incredible, but it's been proven in basically all of the companies I worked at where a developer asked a question and the chat had the answer three, three messages up, and they just, they just skipped it because I guess they just cut up and they figured nothing important was placed above, so I'll just read the last message. So really, it's all about read the chat and then look at the confluence documentation or whatever other non-atlassian product you may use i'm not sure if one exists um and then when you have some time or when you're doing an investigation really delve into a system or documentation deeply and try and understand what it actually means and where it's heading and any improvements you can make to it uh analyzing issues and the impact they may have on developers and fellow qas it goes to understanding the developer situation. And what I mean by that is not only, as I said, once you get enough experience in QA, you should generally understand what each department gets up to. And therefore you will understand kind of in what everyday situations they find themselves in and what might annoy them or what might hinder them. Uh, but it's also understanding like on a more human approach, like, you know, he just came back from holiday, right? He's probably like destroyed with catching up because he hasn't been here a week and a half. I should probably let this man or woman breathe and like give him the stuff later or I should go to someone else. It's the little things again, but it, it makes all the difference in my eyes. Uh, minimizing frustrations, I just said it. You focus on the little things. Uh, you focus on the people you talk to, how their day is going, they're an environment artist, they're a technical artist, they're an animator, you know, see what has annoyed them recently, see if you can help with that. Uh, misunderstandings uh, and, you know, ensuring they do not happen again. You need to be good at communicating, so it's important that you do not miscommunicate what you mean when a misunderstanding happens. Ideally, write it down if you struggle with that and just really go through the motions and then try and have a stoic approach to it. Do not involve emotions whenever there is a misunderstanding, especially if the misunderstanding is of the nature of that a developer, for example, got angry at something. Um, to connect departments, uh, you need to understand where each department is heading. Uh, and that will kind of give you the general knowledge you need. So if you know what the code team is working on, the kind of deliverables they have and where they connect into other departments, you can help those departments grow further. Um, and then being friendly and learning from the past and the future kind of just goes along with the job, really. Um, as, as, long as, as long as you keep an active engagement with everyone in the company, those, let's call them soft skills, should just grow. Um, well, I wouldn't call friendly being a soft skill, but I think that's being offending to, 
term friendly. You should just be friendly to people. Be nice to people. Uh, anyway, um, I'll cover the questions from Nathan from now, I think. Uh, for QA, is there a certain book reporting software that is preferred in industry to Jira's Bookzilla? Um, yeah, so primarily it's Jira. Uh, I've used DevTrack, and if someone will know what this is, 10 points to you, my friend, Redmine. Uh, apart from Jira, those are the only two I've used, um, and they were both terrible. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, Atlassian has a monopoly on game development uh, tracking software. Uh, I say fortunately because Jira, as bad as it can be, could be so much worse, but unfortunately because they don't have any competition. So anything that is bad with Jira, well, um, if you want to have a, a bit of a sad laugh, you can go on Atlassian forums and look at feature requests. And uh, they, for example, there will be a ticket saying, can we have dark mode? And Atlassian said no or yes six years ago and hasn't come around yet. Actually, now that I think about it, they might have introduced it recently. So, yay. Um, do you test any bug fixes, new features, versions with an engine, or do you test within a build? Uh, that depends. Uh, so bug fixes usually will happen in in the build. Uh, new features, uh, they will happen either within the engine or the new build. It kind of depends what stage a certain thing is at. So, for example, if animation is doing some improvements to weapons right um they will they will not want to commit that to a build because if the animations haven't been checked and they're broken then obviously we've just made a problem out of nothing so in cases like that for example i will go into the engine and uh, uh testing that in there um so it really depends but yes as qa you will use both engine and a build uh i find in most companies uh, if you find yourself in a large corporation and as a QA there, you might not get access to the engine, uh, but it really depends on the place. The only place I haven't had access to the engine was TT and Sony. Apart from that, every other single place expected me to use the engine. Um, so yes, it will be an engine as well as in build. Uh, and would you consider having any knowledge within design art programming an advantage when it comes to being a QA? Yes, absolutely. You know. Um, as we all here, I'm sure, know, um, game development is a very difficult job in the end, uh, ironically so, right? Because I'm sure all of us are here because like, yeah, yeah, I love making video games. And then you start to scream when you realize how much stuff there is. Um, so having any kind of knowledge, always a, a benefit and a plus, um, any amount really. Uh, I'll just continue for now and I'll answer more questions later if that's all good. Uh, and this is the other slide. Now that I think about it, I should have answered questions after this. I've kind of derailed it, but you'll have to excuse me. Um, keep it professional. Again, stoic. You know, don't include emotions in any difficult talks you might have. You want to have all the facts down on the table. You want to state what happened. You want to state what will happen if they don't fix it. And that's that. You don't want to include anything like, I feel like feelings are not important at that moment. You know, you need to have a cold calculation of production is denying me the fix for this bug, for this release. What will happen if that bug doesn't get fixed? How many people will be affected? Will it make it on things like Reddit? Like, will it explode in a spontaneous ball of community outrage? You kind of have to think about those things as QA, because if you don't, it Depending on the company, it might land back at you, but back, back at your feet if it does explode, God forbid. Um, being vigilant is thinking about different scenarios and again, different user profiles. What will happen if they do this? What will happen if they do that? Different devices, if you can, depending on the company. If the company is good, they should provide you with different devices to test on. It might be tasking or it might be ad hoc. Um, what will happen if someone is colorblind? You know, simple things like there is a puzzle. Do those colors make sense to every single type of colorblind person? If not, should we have an accessibility option or should we change how it works? Because if you're not colorblind, it might not seem like a big thing, but then suddenly if someone that is colorblind come, comes along, they suddenly can't progress the game without like looking up a guide or following someone on YouTube, which really detracts from the experience. Um, 
evidence-based approach is all about noting things down and staying organized. That's really all it takes. Uh, and again, I've seen my share of QA people who they get told something, they absorb it, and then they go, okay, and they just carry on with their whatever they were doing in that day. And then they get asked about it later, and they're like, uh, ooh, ah, oh, I think it was this. And when the I think gets dropped, the developer or producer will be like, well, is it though? <laughs> And that's why you, again, it sounds silly, sounds simple, but lots of people do that mistake in QA. They just don't note things down when they should. I note everything. I have two different notepads. Um, yeah, having a creative approach to your work in terms of, you know, when you want to think of different user profiles. So it's best to write those down. Like, that's what I do. I write them down and I say, okay, this, this and that. Um, I, I forget what it's called, but the chaotic evil... To you know the charts like absolute neutral, chaotic good, lawful good, etc. Those genuinely help me because I I place user profiles in those, and I'm like, what would a lawful evil person do in this kind of scenario in this puzzle? Um, and then to report bugs, prioritization, uh, key is communication. Uh, you need to be engaged in the title you work on. You need to seek help and feedback. Don't be afraid of seeking help and feedback. Again, depends on the company, but you should hopefully in any company you work on, I would expect QA to be able to like go to a designer or go to a programmer and ask them for help and ask them for feedback on this documentation that you're writing or this thing you're doing for them. It's always important to talk in between departments and even within departments themselves about things, getting feedback for it. Um, having a good knowledge of the database. So, you know, every single day you would like... What I do is I look at Jira every an hour or so, see what new bugs have popped up, see if I can think those if those bugs relate to any other bugs that are in the database. Accessibility, uh, self-explanatory. You just need to write down these are the kind of disabilities that are prevalent, and this is what would affect a certain thing in this title, and this is what we should test against to make sure that those people with accessibility issues can play the game. And then edge cases, again, everyone has different methodology. As I said, I kind of place uh, pl place it in like a chart of like, this is what this kind of person would do. This is what this kind of person would do. And I kind of test against it. You will never get it 100% right. I think it's important to note that. But it's as long as you're trying, it's great. Uh, but edge cases will happen. They will go through. It's just the reality of... Making video games are really complicated things. Some edge cases will slip through, but hey, it's fine. Reddit exists. It will tell you soon enough when those slip through and they break their game. So it's fine. Right. And uh, moving on to effects of having good QA. Uh, and I just want to highlight that briefly. And I'm going to speed up here because I still need to get to the CV section. Whew. Right. Effects of having good QA. You have better developer-to-developer -developer communication, less team frustration. You have better documentation across all departments, maybe except character art. I'm still scared of them. Better design title in general, because if QA can talk to your design team, they can highlight things that even a designer wouldn't think of, because even a designer doesn't play the game as much as QA does. You have a well-managed bug database. You know where your bugs are. You know where they're going. You know what kind of bugs you have. They're not all a mess. Uh, happy play community because QA, I find them the defendant of the community player base, you know. Whenever production allows, of course, the ever eternal battle between can we fix this bug and production says no no place in sprint and I'm like this will make George from the Discord cry. He loves this game and now and producer just goes, No, we can't we can't fix this because there's no there's no there's no place in the sprint. So, you know, whenever we can as a good QA, uh, you know, highlight stuff that annoys community and just act like, yes, we should fix this. Like this should be a bigger priority for us. Um bugs, quality issues are detected, discussed and triage triage early. And then you have less edge cases as you know, they simply are detected way more if your QA department is good. Now, you know, all of this thing, all of these things happen, for example, at expression, but the sad reality is a lot of like bigger companies, they treat QA as bug inputters, if that's a word. But basically you go for a test case and you you input bugs, which really minimizes your 
effectiveness as QA, you know, like things like the better design title, better documentation, better developer to developer communication, all of those things kind of go away. If the company you work for just treat QA as people who put in bugs, because yes, that's what we also do, but it's like saying environment artists just place bushes. They do a bit more than that. <laughs> right. Um, this will be, tell you what, if everyone is happy with this, I will get back to this because I want to cover the CV writing. And this is a bit of a, it's a bit of a longer topic. It kind of depends, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. I'll go through CV writing. Uh, but first, I'll I'll just take the questions that are any questions that are around. Uh, let's see. Uh, Guni asked, "Wouldn't testing within the engine be white box testing?" Yes, correct. Albeit, funnily enough, uh, at least in my experience, nobody uses those terms. Like I know what white box testing, gray box testing, etc. is, but um, yeah, people don't generally use those terms. Um, I find that they're very prevalent in any tutorials you type up on Google, but. Yeah, people, at least in my experience, don't talk about it. Uh, do you need to know coding to get a QA job and be useful in the job? Uh, no, not really, no. Uh, I find that QA, out of all of the different disciplines in game development, is very much all about soft skills. If you can talk to people easily, if you can be friendly, if you can keep in mind what they told you, how they're feeling, what they're working on, you will already be a very good QA. And then on top of that, you just need to work on your communication, the way you report bugs and the way you prioritize bugs. And then from that, things will kind of snap in place. You know, eventually when you talk to developers enough, they will just tell you, I need to look at this, this and that. Can you help me with that? And you will learn from them as you help them. And that'll make you an even better QA. Um, so yeah. I mean, knowing coding would help you, of course. You could do scripting tools or just tools in general, but absolutely not necessary. Um, if you are going into software, like a little addendum here, if you are planning to go into software, you will need to know automation uh, tools like Selenium or any of the number, there are absolute wild number of apps out there for automation testing. Um, but we don't really use that in the games industry. Automation is really limited, and usually it's each company has an in-house solution. There isn't like a company that provides, you know, automated testing just because each game is so uniquely different and on such different architectures that you, ju you just can't provide a general solution, I find. I mean, if someone can, they will make a lot of money, but good luck to them. I think they will deserve that money if, you know, their sanity escapes after they make such a tool and it works. <laughs> Um, so just to let you know, uh, yep. we do have a talk at five o'clock, just just for timekeeping. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Cool. Uh, t -t 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 yeah, Jody, that's correct. Explaining consequences is very useful in determining priorities. And then last from Dave, how often do you use test plans in comparison to actual bug reporting? Because I know bugs to test cases are basically one on one on a day to day, and no one comes after the other. But it depends on the company. Uh, bugs to test cases. Well, I, I'm I'm kind of I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a bit confused by the question because bug reporting, as in you mean entering bugs, as an ad hoc, I presume, versus using a test plan. Um, I think that's what you mean. Uh, I'll just I'll let I'll come back to you once you uh, type up your explanation. Apologies, and I'll just go for the CV writing bit. So, CV writing, Ooh, twenty minutes. We can do this. Common mistakes. Now we'll kind of quickly fire those through because they're relatively easy to understand. I would hope. <laughs> uh, non tangible information, example skill bars, and those that that screenshot is taken from my very own first ever CV. I had skill bars. Do not have skill bars. They're terrible. And the reason they're terrible is you simply have to ask yourself the question of what does this tell the recruiter? And that that asking that question, by the way, is very useful for any kind of your CV. Like, what does this actually tell my recruiter? Because if if you pretend like you don't know yourself, right? What does five out of six bars in leadership mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just like basically a waste of CV space. Um, 
so yeah, any non-tangible information doesn't provide tangible value or explain something about you as a person. You should just get rid of it on the CV. Using too much corpo speak. Um, again, when I do CV reviews, I see this quite often. You know, you should be professional in how you write your CV, of course. And, you know, you can add some extra flair to it, let's call it, but don't go overboard on like, you know, I've engaged in this activity and then like, it's like, it's like a whole paragraph, like a solid giant paragraph. And then you read it as a recruiter, right? And you just say, oh, he just, he has a driver's license, you know, as, as the example, for example, it can really apply to anything. Um, CV is too long with too much unnecessary detail. Uh, so, for example, if you have a lot of job experience, for example, I don't know, you're trying to get into your fourth QA job, right? And you have three different QA companies on your CV, plus four, I don't know, let's say you're working in a restaurant uh, before that. Ideally, at that point, you should probably hide the restaurant experience. You can you can do a little note on the bottom saying more experience available upon request or more experience from other industries available upon request. Just something like that, um, because at that point you don't need it. I've only used non-relating, uh, non-relatable to the games industry experience when I was starting out, because well, I didn't have anything else. So you know, use that to highlight my skills. Uh, but after that, you know, once you have a bit of experience, don't don't make the CV like long. I find the longest for me, but it really depends. Is three pages, but some people don't want to see more than one page, so. Ideally, stick to one page, two, and then like three. If you have like a really beefy career, then three is acceptable. Like I'm fine with three, but I think I'm in the minority. Um, so yeah, one page ideally. Lack of proofreading. This is again very simple mistake, but a lot of people are like, you know, uh, pays attention to detail, and then there is a giant, you know, misspelling on the next word or whatever. It just looks silly. Uh, lacking professionalism. I had a guy apply for a QA job and his interests were meme hunting. Um, I don't know what meme hunting is, um, but I don't really want to see it on a CV. Like, we can talk about it on the interview, um, but yeah, like, I, why would you put that on your CV? Don't, don't do that. And then odd CV design choices. Um, I, I, I wanted to put a picture here, but I didn't find a good example in time, I'm afraid. But basically, you know, either do it like a column on the side and then the main body or just the main body. Don't play around with too many graphics, like throw mm -hmm. stuff around. Uh, ultimately, the recruiter might be confused and they'll be like, nah, thank you very much. I don't need this. Um, and then the biggest mistakes, there are two. First off, the most important one and the most common one I see is listing what you did at a job rather than what you solved. And it, it might seem... Uh, like, what do you mean, Patrick? But let me show you. So this is the kind of typical CV you would see, right? For like a games tester, let's say, right? And seems, you know, oddly, it, it looks good enough, right? They, they list out what they did at a job. You know, they carried out testing using test cases. They were responsible for testing of a certain system. They wrote some test cases for another system. They coordinated with other teams. They have some experience working in Unreal. For and they provided daily support to another team. Seems seems all good, um, but then uh, you need to put yourself in the recruiter's eyes, and this is where it comes down to. For a recruiter, especially nowadays in the games industry, uh, any job will easily have like a hundred applicants, and uh, when you have a CV written like this, it, you're just a buzz astral, uh, because ultimately nobody will have time to interview a hundred people to find out what kind of a person they are which is maybe a harsh but unfortunate reality. And if your CV doesn't have anything that makes you under identifiable as a, you know, like, oh, this guy does this and like he engages in this. If it's just like generic, here is what I did as, as my job, then more than likely it'll just get sidelined, you know, because other people will write a better CV than you. Um, so to amend that, you I use this, which is, you know, you don't, because that's the thing. When a recruiter looks at your CV, like I, when I look at a CV, I know what a senior QA does. I know what a lead QA does. I know what a junior QA does. I don't need you to list me out what you did because I more or less know what you did at that job. What I need you to do is I need you to prove to me that you worked there and you found a challenge and then you acted upon that challenge and you produced an outcome that 
provide a tangible value to the company and provide a tangible value to your team. Um, and then that in return tells me that now, now I have like an image of you in my head, right? You're not just like a QA tester number 54. You're, you know, I don't know, uh, James, and you've introduced this, this and that. So I always use challenge, action and outcome. And, you know, any, any place you, you will have things like that. You know, I'm sure all of you will have examples like that in your workplaces where something has annoyed you or you uh, worked extra hard on something or there was a bit of crunch or there was a bit of, you know, panic in something and you helped organize it. Um, yeah. Uh, and again, I won't go through this because time, but th these are like, this is rewritten from the above, right? And you can, if someone wants to take a screenshot of that for people to read later, please. It's basically like, it's not just telling, it's not just saying you did a job. It's saying I did this on this and this allowed QA to do this. And it also allowed this and I've introduced a system and that instantly tells me like, yes, you've done all of these things. Instead of just doing your job, you've actually gone out and you've, you've, you've improved the place you worked at for the people you work with. And that instantly tells me that, hey, I want, I would like to sp speak to you. It also gives you easy ammunition on the interview, right? Because if you just write down what you did for a job, you won't be prepared. But if you write down something like this, you probably can expect the recruiter to go, so tell me about this, you know, complicated bounty system and how you've written those test cases. And, you know, then you can just speak from your experience and that where it really shines through, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I would read a bit more about this, but I hopefully uh, hopefully you guys are understanding what where I'm going with this. And yeah, you can just ask questions and then I'll get to them in the last five minutes. And then the other major thing is not tailoring your CV to the job. Uh, so what I mean by that is each job description will have something like this. What are our key requirements or responsibilities or something like that? And that gives you a general understanding of what they're looking for. So what you want to do with something like this, and this is taken from Cloud Imperium's QA test, the job posting, which is up right now. So, um, you know, you need to understand what they're looking for. So, and correlate that in your cover letter and then in your CV. So good understanding of testing methodologies, test plan organization, technical requirements. So if you, had a, if you had an industry job, you can talk about how you created those test cases, how you managed, managed a certain system, how you battled a certain problem and how you came to a solution, right? You can expand on it in the cover letter and in the cover letter and then do it a bit, you know, do a shorter version on the CV. Um, if you haven't had a job in the industry, you can kind of correlate it to whatever you did in the past, right? Like, for example, I came from, I worked in restaurants before and obviously I didn't have test cases experience when I was joining TT, but I kind of correlated it to, yes, I worked in a very high pressure environment and I did this, this and that when, you know, service was absolutely overcrowded and I kept calm and I organized myself in a meaningful fashion and I, you know, the service was done. I cooked all the meals in time. Nobody was angry about getting a cold meal. So you can kind of correlate it. Obviously, it will always be a bit of a stretch, but you got to do when you got to do when you're starting out. It will never be easy, I'm afraid. Uh, but as long as you can correlate your experiences, even things like community work or you know, something you did on the side, like uh, I mentioned in my CV that I led a StarCraft clan when I was 14 or 50 people. Um, and that really got the recruiters talking to me. Like I remember my QA manager at TT was like, talk to me about this clan you led. And, you know, I could explain like how I did certain events for them or how I organized them and things like that. So anything that's like shows you and like some experience, because we all had different experiences, right? And like just shows who you are and you can talk about it is good don't don't put like general stuff on the cv so you want to reference just this and kind of just hit those key points so show them that you have strong time management skills show them that you're uh, proficient in this and that uh you know have your cv well written so it proves that you know your communication points are on point mm, and just kind of go along filling all of those and i guarantee you if you do it well enough you will probably get an interview and that moves me quickly onto the cover letter. Mm. This, again, uh, if someone wants to take a quick screenshot of that, because I realized we're almost at the time. I didn't expect to run over. I'm sorry. Uh, but basically, the way I structure my cover letters is a statement about the company. So, like, 
hey, I'm interested to join Cloud. I've recently heard that you guys have released this new update and I'm interested in this and that tech. And that's that's why I that's why I would be interested to join. And then you would give a brief description of like what you did in your previous jobs. And then you would connect again. And this is going back to to this, right? You would grab any of those points and you would connect it to your experience, right? So you'd say, Oh yeah, I'm very good at time management skills because I worked at a restaurant that was uh, you know high end restaurant and clients were very demanding, so I had to manage my time well. And then you would have a closing statement. So you know, kind of, I like to call it your value statement, like what kind of values you believe in as a person, and that you're hoping to hear back from them. Uh, and yeah, this is what I always tell myself to close this out. A cover letter to get them to look at your CV, and that's another thing. I would always recommend a cover letter. Yes, it's true that a lot of recruiters don't read it, but I I I read cover letters, for example, uh, because they allow me to see what kind of a person you are. Um, so it's always better to just include them. So cover letter to get them to look at your CV, CV to get the interview, and then interview to get the job. And on the note of the interview, again, we're kind of short on time, but try and treat the interview like not an interrogation. You want to have questions ready for them. You want to be interested in the company. You want this to be a mutual discussion. You don't want this to be an interrogation where the recruiter just fires all their questions at you. You answer them as best as you can. And then when they go, do you have any questions for us? You just go, uh, not at this moment, because that will tell them that you're not really interested, or if you are, you're kind of scared or unsure or any kind of other insert negative feeling about you here. So you always want to have questions treat it as a mutual discussion about you want to get the job, but you're not sure they're the right fit for you. And obviously they're checking the same in you. And that's it. 